in our programs in general, we have very few people who are at 80% of our area median income, which in uh, Cocoa here would be about 40000 for a family of four or so. Uh, we, do, we do have a few, though. And uh, the average income of our households is about 20% of the area median income by household size, which so that would vary from $8,000 a year up to maybe $15,000 a year in general. Wow. Uh, and these are pictures of some of the renovations that are going on. And please, uh, anyone, stop me at any time because uh, I, I'd rather answer your questions than talk about stuff that uh, may not be quite as relevant. We also have housing choice vouchers. It used to be called Section 8. There's many different versions of housing choice vouchers. Once again, serves the same income limits for our um, households. We do give a, a very strong preference, really it's almost a requirement for folks who enter our programs to be living in COCO. Um, I, 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 can't, I always can't resist telling the story of when it dawned on me, a fellow called me from the uh, Melbourne airport and said, uh, you know, I just came here from St. Louis, and I'm getting one of your units here today. I can pick up the keys, and could you come and pick me up? And I said, well, we don't normally pick up people from the airport. And he said, well, that's okay. I think I can walk it in a couple of days. And I said, well, and it was around December, so I went to a Christmas event down at um, Habitat for Humanity or, or one of the nonprofits and picked him up. And he had two questions, two, three questions. I've forgotten the third one, but he said, um, does the bus take me to the beach? I said, yep, you, know, you can get the bus to the beach. He said, do you think I can get a girlfriend? <laughs> I said, um, <laughs> I, I think there's a possibility of that. And, and I remember the third question. He said, some people think I, I'm a little slow. What do you think? And I said, well, let's keep talking. And we talked the whole way. And he walked into that unit. There was not a piece of furniture in there but a concrete terrazzo floor. And I said, well, <sighs> it's going to be a hard floor sweeping on tonight. And he said, man, this is fantastic. This is great because he, he had been living in a homeless shelter in St. Louis. So we, at that point, dawned on me, w we need a preference for uh, COCO uh, residents, yeah. and that's what we do now. We have a number of other preferences related to criminal histories and um, homelessness, a preference for some homeless uh, folks, particularly from Volunteers of America and some of the homeless programs. Um, and the pictures are still, oh, this is a picture of, uh, it's sometimes monitored, it shows some of the high waters during some of the yeah. rainstorms. Um, and, and I can't remember if we peel through some pictures of criminal activities that have helped the police department to, uh, uh, if not solve a crime, at least to put more pieces of the puzzle together so that the, the case is stronger. Oh, this is, uh, you can't really see, if I can go back maybe. That picture was of a, of, a, of a car that was going about 80 miles an hour, and they were able to track the speed by the pace of the video, uh, and they couldn't make the turn and put a hole in one of our buildings. Um, resident services certainly are a key for us, serving particularly our seniors and our youth. We uh, support a lot of our children going to the uh, summer programs and after school programs. And likewise, have a lot of programs for our seniors. Uh, there, oh, this is a, this is a fellow who committed a felony. There he is. There's our man on the lawnmower. He just was getting ready to stab him right in the eye. Told him he was going to kill him for no obvious reason that I'm aware of. And there's our man with his holding his face. And the perpetrator walking away. Oh, it's a horrible situation. Um, but there is no doubt about about the uh, strength of the evidence that we have there. Mm -hmm. um, we are converting all of our public housing, and this is a little statement about our security cameras, um, uh, sort of saying again what I was just saying, resident services, of course. W and then the RAD conversion, R RAD is Rental Assistance Demonstration. It's a demonstration program created by during the Obama administration. And it um, allows us to convert our public housing units to a different funding platform called project-based rental assistance slash, and, and we're financing the construction of low-income housing tax credits. Uh, project-based rental uh, 
uh, rental assistance is a type of Section 8 or Housing Choice Voucher, but it is a uh, better vehicle for funding affordable housing because we are in the same budget pot as our, well, you could say President Trump, so he participated in uh, on that side of the HUD funding programs back in the 60s. So uh, I, uh, those, those funds have always, that budget has always been funded 100%. The public housing budget is frequently funded at 95%, 90%, I can remember 72%. So even though the Congress has done studies that said, well, you deserve a certain amount of money, Congress then comes back and says, well, you're only going to get 85% of that money this year, which contributes to the way that public housing looks frequently, you know, landscaping and uh, lack of painting, and, and uh, the, the money goes into the uh, things that are required, uh, say, gas system, water system, electric system. Um, we had a large Christmas event with numerous, numerous community partners. The kids I saw walking out of that, um, of the Gilby Smith Center, their hands were full. <laughs> they, they, they couldn't hardly carry another toy. Um, and uh, just jumping around here a little bit, we do do housekeeping inspections of all of our residents. And we're just starting to do housekeeping inspections of our applicants because one of the problems we have is folks who bring in roaches and bed bugs and uh, don't keep up the house properly, which then turns into a problem for the neighbors. Um, and it is a health and safety hazard for everyone. Um, our Pineda, I think I've mentioned this already, our, our Pineda Village project is going to be about $11.5 million of construction. Tokyo Sunrise Terrace, which is our 183 units on the south side of town, uh, District 1, you could call it, um, or District um, one. Yeah, District 1, mm -hmm. is about $13 million. And there is a, um, a focus on energy efficiency. Uh, we could find nothing about solar being encouraged, although I'm sure it would be allowable. So we, we'll be meeting with them over the next month or two, and we're certainly going to bring up uh, the aspect of solar power. We actually did power some security cameras uh, that were monitoring the construction site. Uh, matter of fact, one of our pictures showed the only theft of our construction site. We had the clear picture of the fellow <laughs> just walking along with his um, whatever he used to cut through the fence. Um, was up there also in one of the pictures. Uh, I am um, yeah. open to any questions at all. I think we're getting near the end of the pictures here. I, so I just want to. Mm -hmm. I just want to thank you because I. It's just so nice uh, to see that some of the units over there are no longer look like their traditional project homes, and, and I think it looks really nice, and I think it really helps um, uh, that. Um, that area of the city, you know, um, with ref and then the homes over there, it makes a big difference. So I uh, appreciate what you guys have done. And and I just hope that, and this was something I didn't mention last night when, when I spoke with you all, I I just hope that we're educating um, people with reference to, you know, just because you live in, 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 in the project homes or, or whatever, it doesn't mean that you're exempt from getting out and you know, just trying to keep the area clean, and uh, and I'm seeing that throughout the city. That, you know, uh, just a lot of trash throughout our city, and uh, just trying to encourage people that just you know pick it up. Let's let's be proud of our community and our city. So, but I, I think, and, I, and like I said, I hope they're getting some education. Everyone's getting educated when it comes to keeping our city clean. So, you know, my theory on that is that we have a lease with all of our residents. And um, that lease is um, <coughs> very strong. Uh, people can speed on the public streets. They get a speeding ticket. But if they violate our, viol violate our lease enough, we can evict them. Okay. And we don't lose many cases in the court system. If it gets that serious, and we've yeah. evicted people for poor housekeeping, obviously rent, okay. uh, non-rent payment, and um, just being disruptive to the neighborhood, arguing or being in a bad mood all the time and scaring other people. Right, right. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank appreciate you, you coming. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Alex, for inviting him to come. Yeah, for, yeah, no problem. And, I'm, and I apologize. I was in the, intending to let everyone, I wish everyone a happy new year and, and I'm hoping
that everyone had a safe and joyful Christmas. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and uh, move on to um, delegations. Um, you have five minutes to speak. Uh, just remind everybody to be respectful of each other. And uh, Mr. Warren McKee will be coming first to Did we, could you give us your name, address, and <coughs> My name is Warren McKee. I live at 2142 Michigan Avenue. I think the sign kind of says it all. Slow down and speed bumps. You decide. Or up to you. Uh, may I lean it here? Yes, yes. yes. I'm not here because my neighbor got killed. Take your time, sir. I'm here because we haven't done anything to stop that stuff in the past. And it led to him getting killed. <coughs> we got to do something. And for the last few years, I've been thinking there's got to be something we can do about this speeding on Michigan Avenue. And um, talking to the wife, she looked up on the computer, and um, the city of Cocoa said that we could petition. We could file a petition. But there's a certain criteria we needed to follow. So I went to all my neighbors that were home. And um, an overwhelming majority of my neighbors said, let's go for it. Um, so I'm here to tell you that we in the 2000 block of Michigan Avenue are prepared to petition the city of Cocoa for speed bumps. We are also willing to work with the city of Cocoa. Uh, I think I speak for everybody when I say whatever we can do to make that street safer, we want to do. We have a little more vested interest in it than most people. Um, when Channel 6 came by, this lady sitting over here walking her dog and is afraid to cross the street. You all want to live that way? Another, another, another neighbor on Channel 6 said he saw two diesel trucks speeding down the road side by side. I've been passed. It's a double yellow line. I've been passed by people. I've been given the bird by people. I've been yelled at. I picketed. I got a lot of thumbs up. I got a few boos. Um, what I've discovered is most people care. But we got that, I don't know, probably 20 or 30 percent that just does not care. Our police force, they come out, they did radar for three days, and they were very busy, very busy. But they can't be there every day. They can't be there 24 7. You know, so we got to do something. Um, I talked to some of the fire department guys um, about speed bumps, a lot of pros and cons about them. You know, if you're having a heart attack, you want them guys there as quick as they can get there. Well, they got to slow down for a speed bump. But on the flip side, if I'm walking my dog and it's going to slow this clown down, let's put them in, baby. So, I'm for speed bumps. I'm for two speed bumps right on that main stretch, and um, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get them, unless you all have a better idea. Um, I wanted to tell you, 
I met Mr. Lachance's daughter. She lives out of state. And um, I told her what I was doing for the community. I guess she's in her 40s or 50s. But she told me when she was a little girl, her father used to warn her about going out near Michigan Avenue because he was afraid she would get run over. We're talking 30, 40 years. And we haven't done anything. Now, I've only lived there for seven. So, but I can tell you what, in that seven years, I've seen a lot more traffic. I've seen, uh, let me find my notes here real quick. I know I only got five minutes. The trucks, semis, dump trucks, wreckers, garbage trucks, school buses, these big trailers these guys pull behind their pickup trucks, tree trucks, the ones that FEMA brought in. They use our street as a shortcut. I know the one council member told me it's a throughway. It's not a throughway. It's a residential street. A throughway is 520, 524. So here we are dealing with all this stuff. The police just doesn't have the manpower. Maybe we need to generate some revenue, give him a few hundred thousand dollars, get a few more police out there. I don't know what, I don't know what your solution will be, but I know we have a problem. I know we also have a two and a half ton weight limit on that street that could be enforced. Um, I think I'll close with this. Close your Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Warren, you know, the last time we spoke, and uh, I mean, I can testify to everything uh, Warren's talking about here, we stood outside for an hour and Forty percent of the traffic was way above the speed limit, and there were several large um, trucks that sped by as well. But the last time we talked, um, you were—I I thought you were interested in the stop signs. Have you decided that you'd rather go speed bumps? If if you think if you think that the stop signs will work. Why not try it? It's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I'm kind of convinced that um, somewhere in the next few years, mm -hmm. we'll see speed bumps. I just, people are so hard headed, they won't listen. And if I may say one other thing, <coughs> Mrs. Koss and um, uh, Boy there. Boy there. Boy there. Um, and I spoke with the uh, police chief on the telephone, uh, some other. Uh, city dignitaries, I just want to thank you for your kindness and willingness to work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, can I say, uh, Mayor Williams, I was really, uh, you know, affected by <coughs> this tragedy on Michigan Avenue for people that aren't familiar. Um, and I would just like everyone to know because his obituary, uh, Mr. Richard Lachance, his obituary was in the paper yesterday, and there will be a funeral mass on Friday, January 18th at the Divine Mercy Catholic Church. And in lieu of flowers, uh, donations could be made to St. Vincent de Paul Society, care of the Divine Mer Mercy Catholic Church. So um, thank you for being here and, and, um, and activating your community and I'm not sure what, how, I know we've been monitoring it. I'm not sure what kind of data we need before <coughs> stop signs kick in or how that works, but are you able to? That's something that's, it's going to come back to us. I, I know okay. there's, yeah, they're, they're collecting some data right now, and then as soon as that's done, we're going to, well, our staff will determine what's the best approach to take with it, but, but we, we, we hear you, we understand. I've been out there, I've, I've looked at it, I've driven it. I was pretty much uh, uh, 
almost ran off the road because I was I was going to speed limit. I, I know what's happening there. I've, I've it's been going on for quite some time now. So I got but, passed the other day by a car because it said somebody went around me because I was going the speed limit. But we we are going to address that in uh, Councilman Gordon. Well, the only thing I had was um, this question for the city manager. What about changing, along with stop signs or speed humps, whatever we choose to do, uh, changing the speed limit um, when you come around the curve past Cocoa High School? I think um, going into the residential area, we like you, you stated, it was 30 miles an hour. Um, was it, well, can it possibly be changed at a certain point? Well, there's a 15 mile per hour coming in that little bend before you get to the residential, and then it changes to 30 miles an hour. But there is right there in that little bin. It's 15 miles an hour. Gotcha. And, uh, I think so it's 35 by the high school. Right. By yeah, it's 35, 35 around the high, I think by it the high is, school. Yeah. But then it turns when in that little bin right before it gets to the residential area. It's 15 miles an hour, and then it converts back to 30 miles an hour. Mm, right. Yeah. Since you're talking about that, I, I, I'm amazed that we have a speed limit at 30, mm -hmm. and the police won't pull you over until you're 35. They won't write your ticket until you're like 38. And so, we're good to speed limit. Yeah. But we're gonna. I mean, if we can't yeah. enforce it, why have it? It's like all these other laws. Yeah. But with the data collected, we're gonna uh, come up with a good solution. And uh, and then, uh, <coughs> but, but this is not this is not going away anytime soon. So, is there any way you can make me a part of that process, so that I can keep my neighbors informed of what's going on? We yeah, we would definitely keep you informed. Yes. I'd like to be a part of the process. Yeah. So, I know what it takes. Yeah. I mean, if I got to volunteer to be a short-term <laughs> yada yada <laughs> sign with me yeah. chief sign him up for the vcop program <laughs> yeah that'll be good but but yes we will make sure that you're, you're kept informed and, and all the residents over there residents there can be informed about what's happening and, and what's going on but this is not going on deaf here we're we, we hear you we've been there where do we so. get the petition um you guys just start a petition you do it you, you got the, 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 your, the website for City of Coco says that there's certain criteria that you guys require. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows where I can get that criteria from. Just go we, can, we, can, yeah. we, can we can provide it to you. Because yeah. mm -hmm. I think we may want to go ahead and get that process mm -hmm. going just in case you guys drag oh, it. Oh, definitely. Oh, you definitely want to do that, yes. Yes, without a doubt. I thought that you guys were going to be doing that anyway, but okay, yeah. Well, we're on the same page, I think. Yes, Let's yes. just get her done. Yes, yes sir. Yes. Thank yes, sir. You. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Rusty Singer. Yeah, no. <laughs> Singer. I'm sorry. <laughs> good evening. Uh, Rusty Single, um, 5683 Saratoga Lane, also the uh, Cocoa Firefighters local president of the union. I'm here just going to give you an update of the uh, 2018 turkey um, dinners that we pass out every year. Uh, just a quick little history of it. We started it, well actually Chief, Chief Romfrey started it somewhere in the mid-90s. He was just went to help out a couple families and then it grew and then it grew and uh, when Chief Rumpley left us, the union took over, and right now we're averaging over 100, 100 uh, full dinners every year. This year we started off with a we we start with 100, and we took some extras, 110, and then we had some extras that came in, so we we ended up with 122 um, requests. And just so you know, that all the requests are they're all uh, Cocoa citizens. So we're, we're able to pass out 118. We have four no-shows, so it's pretty good average. It's, it's pretty normal for each year. And each dinner consists of a, a frozen turkey, 13 to 15 pounds, potatoes, stuffing, vegetables, and a dessert. So it's pretty much a, a full dinner. Uh, we couldn't have done it without the, uh, the help of uh, fire administration and, and the citizens and, and also a lot of people a lot of uh, other employees throughout the city. We had people drop off turkeys, they drop off cash, um, but there was a few people that went above and beyond. I just kind of want to give credit where it's due. Uh, Larry Sinclair <coughs> donated 40 turkeys. Dave Lightholder donated 40 turkeys. I think there was a competition going on there, so we like that. Uh, the Village Playhouse, every year they do a raffle 
and uh, they do a 50-50 raffle, and they, they donate half of the proceeds to that. And then we had a, an anonymous citizen. He wanted to stay anonymous, but he, he walked into the station on Dixon and gave $500 cash. He wouldn't tell us his name, didn't want to give us his name, so, um, but we were very appreciative. And mostly I want to give a, a lot of credit to our administrative secretary, Joanne Soper. You know, without her, she's kind of the hub. She's there every day. She was taking requests. She really did a lot, and uh, I want to give her a lot of thanks. And, uh, and everybody in the city that, that donated cash and that, that donated turkeys, we really appreciate it. Generally speaking, every year when we get the, uh, the, all the requests in and we get all the donations in, um, whatever we need to pick up, the union picks up. This year was great. Um, we actually had an, an excess of money. So um, it was, seems like it was, everybody's very generous this year. So going into next year, we got some money moving forward. Uh, so it was a it was a great year, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Oh, well, thank you, and thank you to all the folks that donated and and uh, volunteers. We appreciate it. Uh, yeah. You're welcome. I'm gonna um, come back probably the the second meeting in January, or maybe the first meeting in February, and we're gonna give you the stair climb um, mm -hmm. results. Okay. That was very successful, and. Uh, I'll let, the, I'll let the person that was running that, I'll let him uh, speak on that behalf. Okay. Yeah. And then just one last thing, we have a, a, a donation to the PALS program. Um, um, Ms. Warner said she'll take the, uh, the donation. Uh, I'm gonna make sure that it gets out to them. Okay. I appreciate Ms. it. Ms. Delora. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, Delora, we got you some money. Thank you and be safe. Reminder, Chief, I'll be by to see her in the morning. Okay, thank you. Good, good, good light switch. Okay, next we have Amy Thompson. Please give us your name and address. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Amy Thompson. I live at 928 Peachtree Street. That's in District 1. First, I'd like to congratulate the new mayor and thank you, Mr. Goins. Um, I live in District 1 at 928 Peach Street. If you're not familiar to where that is, let me tell you, I lived in a, I live in a house, been there for about five, six years now. It's right next to the convenience store that's located on Peach Street and Fisk. I'm right across the street from the Salvation Army, the Women's Shelter, also adjacent to the Homeless Vets. Let me briefly tell you a little bit about myself and my family. I am a registered voter. I'm also a retired EMT, full-time, 24 years up in New England in the inner cities. I work 9-11 for five days in an ambulance. I'm a stay-at-home mom with a two-year-old. I take care of a disabled parent. She's a stroke survivor times two and a heart attack recipient. My husband works full-time and he's also a Navy vet 14 years. And I also worked as a director of operations for a local ambulance company up in New England. <sighs> Sorry guys, I gotta. Tonight I'm here to address the violence, the drug dealings, and the prostitution in that neighborhood. The recent double shootings that happened on Peachtree Street on Thursday was the straw that broke the camel's back. I shouldn't have to sit on my couch and hear 10 consecutive gunshots followed by a bunch of screams and people running down the street. I've dealt with a lot of stuff in that neighborhood. I've witnessed fights, drug deals, and sexual acts being performed, not only in my front yard, but up and down the street. I can't even bring my son to Prospect Park in Fern because of the amount of people that hang out and do things that, they're, that aren't suitable, not for a child, but let alone anyone else. They have littered and used that playground as their own personal bathroom, finding drug paraphernalia and just copious amounts of litter and people sleeping under that pavilion. 
I spoke to many people in that neighborhood, and they're, they're done with it. We want our neighborhood back. I've picked up trash. I picked up drugs and drug paraphernalia because people can't seem to find garbage receptacle in that parking lot that is adjacent to my house. I've called CPD numerous, on numerous occasions for different things. I just want to tell you that the response time is horrible. I have been told by the dispatch if there's no available units, they will get there when they can. To me, it's unacceptable. I know you can get BC, uh, BCSO to come and help out, but they don't want to have to explain to the DOT why they needed backup. It's all about numbers. It's a number game. The lack of police presence is mind-blowing in that, in that whole entire area. It's a very scary thing to the community because we've had lots of, I've had lots of conversations with hardworking families in that area. There's lots of us that have families, that have little kids, that want to use that park, that want to walk their dogs up and down the street and not feel like we're prisoners in our own home, in our own neighborhood, for fear of gunfire, fights breaking out, or even being solicited by prostitution and homeless people. There was an incident about two years ago at my house, about approximately 1 a.m. in the morning. My son was about a couple months old. Six people decided to come up on my porch because the prostitute was trying to seek refuge because she upset her pimp. But instead, they decided they wanted to try and kick down my door. I called dispatch. I was on the phone with them for 20 minutes, and I took a screenshot, and I have them begging for help. That shouldn't have to happen to anyone, regardless. No person should go through that. I could go on about the safety and the cleanliness in the neighborhood, but I don't have enough time. I just want this neighborhood back. It's a good neighborhood. There's lots of hardworking people that have been there for a long time, but it's being overrun by the crackheads, by the prostitutes, and people that just have no right being there. People want this neighborhood back. It has potential. Finally, I want to state that if this is not a bashing on CPD, it's a safety concern, not only for my family, but for the neighborhood. I truly and fully support all first responders. Believe me, I was one for 24 years, and I know what it entails. Thank you. Thanks, ma'am. Well, before, before you sit down. Hi, Alex. <laughs> you all right. Um, I had a discussion with Chief about this same situation. Uh, this was last week. Um, cause we was in the area probably yes. maybe an hour or so before the shooting happened. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm disturbed just as much as you are. Yeah. Um, a lot of things have been happening the last, i uh, say, maybe five to six weeks that's been pretty rough in the yeah. area. Uh, we have an issue on Fern and Prospect that's been going on for far too long. I agree. Yeah. So that's something that me and Chief talked about. Uh, we're going to get together this week and try to strategize. We're going to need help for the community. I would well, love so. nothing more to get out there and walk the streets and talk to people yeah. and try to put a stop to this. Yeah. I'm all for my community. Right now, I don't have a choice to leave. So my thing is, if I don't have a choice to leave, let's make it a better place, not only for myself, but for my family. Yeah, yeah. And I see a lot of hardworking people, elderly. You know, I live two doors down from that shooting. And that there is no re and it's so unacceptable that yeah. people hang out there and loiter every day, every night on both sides, not only at Bald Heads, but at Pete's. Yeah. It's unacceptable. Yeah, yeah. Move on. We, we got you, and I appreciate it. And if it. I can't see, yeah. and I'm sorry, I haven't seen a police presence since that shooting. There was no police officer sitting at Fall Heads 9 o'clock in the morning, mm. the day after. Mm. That's unacceptable to me, and I'm sorry. Okay. If that happened at 9.30 in the morning, my kid was playing outside, there'd be a big issue on their hands. Mm. Big issue. Right. More than what there is now. 
I just want the neighborhood and I want to take it back with But we will be everybody. reaching out to you, ma'am. Thank, thank you. I've, yeah, I've Alex, I'll definitely call, call me well. tomorrow. Yeah, I will. All right. I will. Thank you guys so much and I appreciate it. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, next we have um, Reverend Dennis. Good evening, everyone. Reverend J.B. Dennis, 3017 Catalina Drive. I'm going to talk about ineffective leadership in the black community. I was in here in 2017, 2018, it is 2019, about unarmed black people being victims of excessive force by the Coco police, and no one is being prosecuted for these actions. This is a new year. And we're going to have a new strategy on in and this foolishness that's going on. As far as the, what the lady just said, we want to see the Coco police with K lines in those parks, not some of them, all of them, at least twice a day. That would get the drug dealers out and keep them out. If somebody drive up and see a K line with a police officer in a the park, they're not going to stop there to buy any drugs. They're not going to stop there to try any prosecution either. Prosecu prostitution, I'm sorry. The bad news is that. Police abuse in the city of Coco is a serious problem. In 2002, Chief David Crawford was asked to resign. <coughs> Coco has a long history that seemed to defy all attempts at edification. The latest crime, a caller is shot through the officer's windshield who had committed no crime, but called the police for help. He was not a suspect, nor was Mr. Seals a threat. No police department in this country is known to be completely free of misconduct, but it must be fought locally. Under USC 42, Police Misconduct Statute 14141, it states a police officer can use a necessary force to make an arrest, but to shoot someone through a windshield when there is no threat is an act of a coward. If you fear for your life, you're in the wrong line of work. The bias case should be given to the state attorneys for prosecution and we're going to insist on it because we are talking with the you know, I mean, FDLE each week. Reform and new leadership is needed. If a football team is losing the games, you don't fire the team, you fire the coach. Thank you, sir. Uh, Miss um, Candace Rogers. Candace Rogers, 93 Delanoy Avenue. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And as we, before we get too much further into the new year, let's go back and kind of catch up on some unfinished business. On April the 10th, former Mayor Parrish asked Mr. Garganesi to determine the easement between the Riverwalk and the Lee Winter Park. Has that determination been made? Which easement? The boardwalk. The boardwalk. Connecting the river, the river walk or boardwalk, as you may want to call it, from Coco Marina to Lee Winter Park, and then reconnecting with the rest of the river walk. The um, I did s speak to the assistant city manager about that and looked into the easement document, and if we're talking about the the same place, it's been some time now. Um, if we're talking about the easement that runs along State Road 520 and then down the um, small driveway towards the um, um, uh, river riverfront, right? Is that that's the easement? It connects. It the connects. sidewalk connects to yeah. the Mariner right. parking lot. Mar Mariner, Mariner parking lot. That's that's the easement document that um, that the city uh, received. If I from whom? Correctly, uh, I believe from the. Prior developer, the town real because the 2005 settlement states the marina granted the city all easements that would be necessary to allow the city to complete the river walk between the marina and Lee Winter River Front Park, and if you look at it in July, I brought this up in February, I brought it up in April, and in July. At 3 o'clock in the morning, they start laying the sidewalk, and I couldn't understand how that was going to connect to the boardwalk. The boardwalk 
is a public boardwalk. July the 17th, the city permitted, I believe it was the Coca Marina, to put up a fence and a gate. So there is no access to the east side, north or south, of the marina. Can I just <coughs> I, the and I, I really want a legal picture all determination. This, the, um, we did look at as the the staff member that uh, presented before the governor and the cabinet on this issue. The the parties were the city and w uh, Cocoa Village Marina to the settlement agreement. Mariner Square was not one of the parties. Correct. They don't and own the land. So and the the perpetual access easement is over the promenade and boardwalk that the Coco CRA uh, paid for. And then when they sought to convert the slips from uh, public to private, the in part of the settlement was that, you know, you would have, have all money access. And the, but we would get that perpetual access easement. It didn't include the Mariner Square and or behind that. Right. However, the Mariner Square was not part of that since they don't own the cap to the seawall. The cap to the seawall allows the uplands to be that part of the Coco Marina. I spoke with the original owners, the Whitleys, and they gave me the history, which I did present to the council. But this is not, I'm chewing up my time here, so I want to kind of move along. I think we need a little better definition because it seems to me that once they put the gate up, it's kind of like the gauntlet had been thrown down. And so that then brings me back to what was the supporting statistical documentation for the relinquishment of all the public dockage at the Coco Marina as referenced in the settlement agreement? And this would be something you'd have to come back to me on. It's on page 12, item 12, excuse me, page 11 through 12. And I think we should revisit that because the history is getting lost here as to who owns what, and I would like to get that clarified. So it, uh, the settlement agreement, I think if you read it, it, it they would demonstrate that they Correct. had so many slips available Correct. for public access Correct. over a five-year period. I believe it was a three-year period. Three Maybe three three-year period. And keep in mind the settlement agreement happened at the precipice of the recession. The well, it, it did also ask that you determine by statistical documentation. They, 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 they provided, provided that. They and provided I would like that. to see that and know they where to find it. What I was trying to get at is they were able to accomplish that by virtue of the recession. Nobody was buying the, the, the condominiumized slips. So therefore, all the slips were available so they could demonstrate for three years that they had, you know, available slips for the public. Did they advertise yes. that? What's that? Did they advertise it? They actually auctioned slips off. I mean no, I mean, did they advertise that the docks were for rent? Because that was part of the agreement that they would have it. And even if the, the city had the choice, even if they could show it, that they didn't necessarily have to relinquish those docks, the rental docks. But that we could sit here and chew up more time, and I want to move along because that's just an issue I think we need to have clarification on. Um, at this point, the marina does owe us money, $280,000, which has been sitting on the books for 13 years. We also have other requirements that they are to fulfill if we do the mooring field, whether it's the taxi or the $50,000 to go towards permitting. I think we should have a conversation with the marina to reestablish what it is that they actually owe the city and to make sure that we have not given up the access to the public to the boardwalk. Okay, the, the, okay. the access is there, and actually the liability for the, the, the amount owed is still listed on our CAFR, and, I mean, in our, on our balance sheet. And, and I want to say, and it probably, it's probably been four years since it was looked at, uh, we did meet with them Actually, it was probably like, well, a couple months ago, Anthony, you and I started talking about this again. It's time to revisit it. But anyway, it, it, we met with them, I, I want to say, 
four years ago, and uh, at that time, they did not have the, 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 the funds to pay. Uh, they pay. They made the first installment, and they made, they right, made the and second installment, but there is a balance due. We continue to carry it, and we will be pursuing well, it. Well, it doesn't do us any good just to be carrying it on the book. It makes it look like we have more than what we are going to have something, and if we don't ask for it, we won't get it. I think we need to resolve that. It's been 13 years. Recession is over. Yeah, but that, that's something we were going to be addressing, but because there's been so much other stuff going on, we hadn't gotten to that right. yet, because I was a part of the original team that actually went before the governor <coughs> and his cabinet um, for those slips that, that we needed right. for public access. So this, this is not a criticism. This no, is I saying understand. let's revisit the history and reestablish. And I think, if you don't mind, Candace's point is that, I mean, they have put a gate up. Yes. So, it, you know, we're for a while. that's a real problem in terms of us making the most of that boardwalk and it, well the ability to go. But they're they're we don't have legal access across yeah. Mariner Square property. Exactly. Well, but it there is enough it room, is it not, if Mariner, if the Mar marina owns the sea cap? and so many feet up beyond that, if we didn't even ask if we could have uh, come across there and say you thought you might be offending the condominium offices, which that's actually landfill, they just, where their building is is what they're, that's it. Uh, we could have said, well, we'll give you some extra lighting for security because they have a homeless person behind their dumpster there that's made it his home, they call him the urinator. Excuse me. So anyway, um, actually, uh, I stat, uh, the former redevelopment program manager did reach out to Mariner Square, good. and they were not interested in providing access. That's why they had the gates up. They had the gates up long before. I mean, they even have gates up to where. I mean, I mean, uh, the chief can talk about where the police vessel is. You got to go through a gate there. They've always had gates up, and then they put the other up. But they were approached about because the idea was to connect it to there go around, and then we were, they were. Well, last year when I asked about this, <coughs> nobody had said they had been contacted, just to have that on the record, and that was last year. So anyway, um, if we could just get some clarification on these points, I would appreciate it. Um, and then the last is, is there a city ordinance of against sleeping and camping in city parks? I'm not for sure. I'd have to look that, have yeah. to look that yeah, up. Yeah, I'm not for sure. Do you, do you know anything about that? I, I don't believe there is. I'd have to go back and look also, but I don't, I don't believe remember, remember ever seeing Okay, that. because many residents that I've heard at the last District 1 City Hall complained about people sleeping in the parks, and they made the remark, well, I don't think they're doing that down at Riverfront Park. Well, that's incorrect. Um, they still are and they're sleeping and camping in the gazebo area in downtown, well, I won't call it downtown, in the village. And I feel that I've heard complaints this evening about the same thing. So if we don't have an ordinance, there's nothing against the law or the Constitution to have that as an ordinance in city parks. And then if we do not have it and we do uh, have it created, then I would like to have signs <coughs> made stating such. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next we have uh, Mr. Demetrius Waters. Good evening, everyone. My Good name evening. is Demetri Waters. I live at 911 School Street. I am a community activist, a community advocate, single father, retired veteran, disabled. Today is a very sad day for me because I had been deeply anguished about what I had to come and share with my fellow citizens as an evaluator and as a community advocate of District 1 and the Diamond Square Grant. 
today I'm coming to ask you, one, to reevaluate the Diamond Square brand from 1998 to the present day. At the same time, I'm coming requesting of the mayor and the Economic Development Board and my city councilman governed under the original charter and the making of this district by Mr. Rudy Stone to suspend all members of the Diamond Square Board and have them not be retained under term limits. At the same time, I'm here to ask my mayor and my city councilman under the original charter and easement to create this district to remove under order 13983 a request to enforce limitations of term limits of members upon the Diamond Square Board. The rest of the requests are listed with the clerk of the court. Even though it's required by Florida administrative law that I submitted in notary form, I did not have time. I trust that these good individuals upon this board who have ethics and not political speediness will overlook that F. But I would like to sit with my mayor and my city councilman to discuss the other eight points to make it a nut, to make it a whole, to end this conversation. The people of District 1 is done. Okay, we done. There is no debate. There is no reconciliation. It's not even pet the dog no more. We done. So go back to those special interests, which they used the 19, excuse me, they used the 2008, which the city manager is fully aware of what I'm speaking of, to justify their meaning and position within the Diamond Square. It's over. The party's over. They're chasing us from the county and the party's over. There will be no more stealing. There will be no more lying. There will be no more misleading. And there will be no more petting. The party's over. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <coughs> OK. That was, that was all we had with uh, reference to delegation. So we're going to move on to our consent agenda. What is the I wishes of the motion we approve of consent agenda? Second. We got a motion by Councilman Don Bovair, second by Deputy Mayor Warner. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that passes 5-0. We're going to move on to public hearings, which we have two items that are um, item one and two that's been postponed for the 23rd of, of January the 23rd, 2019. Uh, so we're going to move on to council business. And uh, that is to confirm the mayor's reappointment of Mr. Thomas Cold um, to the housing authority of the city of Cocoa to December 31st, 2022. And we have administrative services here. Yes, sir. Um, I don't believe Mr. Cole's in the audience. I don't see him. Um, I think he's out of town. Okay. Yes. Uh, he served on this committee since, um, on this board since 2013. So he's requesting a, a new term through 2022. Thank you, ma'am. Motion to approve. We got a motion by Councilman Don Bovair. Second. Second by Councilman Goins. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes 5-0. We're going to move on to city business. Uh, my first item is approve a budget resolution amending the 2019 budget and a budget transfer for the purchase of an under-budgeted capital item, uh, 12019 Nissan Frontier Crew Cab for the Community Service Department utilizing the source well vehicle purchasing contract, formerly NJPA number 2019-120716-NAF. Public Works Director. You stole my thunder. Uh, I'm sorry, this, sir. This is for a replacement <laughs> vehicle that uh, was not budgeted um, because mm -hmm. it uh, broke after the uh, budget was approved. Mm -hmm. um, we've located a vehicle that would uh, uh, fill the need and um, found money in the budget uh, for this vehicle. So uh, we're asking for council to approve the purchase. Thank you, sir. Any wishes of the council? Motion to approve. Second. Sec we got a motion by Councilman Gowen, a second by Deputy Mayor Warner. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
passes 5-0. Item number two on the city, city business. Thank you. Approve a resolution amending F, uh, fiscal year 2019 budget, reclassifying capital accounts which no longer meeting, which no longer meets the capital threshold into operation account, operating account to assure a project budget due to the purchase order rollover under budgeted funds through the use of water and sewer utilities and um, general funds contingency reserves. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this item um, addresses uh, an accounting reclass, basically. Uh, council approved the uh, modification of the definition of a capital asset. And so by that change, it makes certain expenses go into different account numbers. Mm -hmm. So this agenda item is reclassing those things that were adopted under the budget as capital items to operating items. In addition, there were some items that were uh, found to be incorrect through um, the budget rollover. Um, the, we left the purchase orders open for the first time this fiscal year, and we had to reapply uh, the budget for those items. So this agenda item is addressing the correction of the errors that were found from that process. Ca and staff is requesting approval for this item. Thank you, ma'am. Motion to approve. Second. We, we got a motion by Deputy Mayor Warner and a second by Councilman Don Bovair. Sure All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. It passes 5-0. Uh, my third item on the city business is a approval resolution amending the fiscal year 2019 budget to reallocate funds from the water and sewer system revenue bonds, series 2018B, new money bonds from uh, reclassification, <laughs> R&M, <coughs> project WS 19 BB to the capital to the new capital project. Mr. Utilities, uh, Utilities Director. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, just a quick summary. Um, if, if council, uh, some of you were on council, but the bond resolution that was approved for the $40 million bond that we got last year, uh, fiscal year, uh, has a clause in there that allows us to adjust capital projects as necessary. Uh, this particular item that's before you. Uh, the item that was identified as a capital project, and in fact, once it was bid, was uh, you know was a lot less than what was anticipated. So it doesn't really fall, you know, in, in the category where we'd want to push bond money to. We can, we're going to cover that with uh, revenues, and so we've got an, uh, a different project identified. And so the money is exactly the same. We're just changing the name of the project, and we need your authorization in, in order to do so per the bond resolution. I'm going to answer your questions if you have any. Thank you, sir. Was the wishes of the council? Motion to approve. We got a motion by Councilman Kosh, Councilwoman Kosh. Second. Second by Deputy Mayor Warner. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-0. I'm not going to read this whole thing. It's a multi-year contract. We're repping <laughs> the, the Sholee Smith uh, uh, facility. Uh, Mr. Public Works Director, this is with reference to our RFQ, so Rankin, but go ahead, sir. Yes, uh, Mayor and Council, um, I don't see my little PowerPoint here. I'm just going to look back and see if uh, I saw the FAQ start me with this. No, I don't see it. Just like an old outdated system we well, have here. I get started. Uh, this is uh, a somewhat complicated agenda item. Uh, regard, it's uh, regarding the Jolie Smith Center. Uh, city staff has been busy uh, with the design build procurement process. Uh, it's a two part process. Uh, the uh, consultants uh, interested uh, on the first uh, go around sent uh, uh, written. Proposals, uh, staff met, ranked those, and then we had a, uh, a presentation phase of the project. Uh, the the uh, firms were ranked. Uh, they were uh, 
several firms. Uh, WMJ was ranked number one. And uh, so we're asking uh -huh, uh, for council to uh, number one, approve the design build ranking recommended by the selection committee. Uh, authorized negotiation of a multi-year design build contract for Joey Smith Community Center with the top ranked design team of WMJ, uh, SARC Architecture and Construction Engineering Group. This was based in response to RFQ 19-07 COC. Uh, the second step is to authorize city manager or his designee to negotiate a guaranteed maximum price and construction schedule. Um, authorize city manager to enter into a guaranteed maximum price design build contract with uh, W and J Sark and uh, construction uh, engineering group. Uh, the total amount would not exceed three million two ninety five eight thirty nine uh, for the uh, construction of the of the Joey Smith Community Center. In addition, an amount of 150000 will be reserved for construction contingency items over the negotiated GMP. Uh, the contingency amount may be increased if the final negotiated GMP is less than $3,295,839. Uh, we're also requesting you to authorize city manager to approve change orders and additional service contracts up to the contingency amount authorized by city council. Uh, number three, approve the attached resolution that memorializes the city manager has been authorized to negotiate and enter into a design build contract with WMJ uh, and authorize the city manager to issue purchase and change orders and additional contracts related to the project uh, set forth in resolution 18-659. Um, basically, we've gotten a soft GMP from the contractor in the amount of uh, 3295839 uh, the building is designed at a approximately 40% completion. Uh, we're asking council to allow the city manager to sign a contract to actually uh, perform the construction. Uh, this is for phase one. And let me see if the clicker here is going to work. Uh, phase one is uh, shown in the uh, drawing here in this bubbled in area. Basically, it includes the building of approximately 15,000 square feet, uh, related site work, which includes a parking lot of uh, around 25 spots. Uh, this gets us started. So if there's questions or concerns. Uh, I just yeah, go I just got one, one request is that um, when I was looking through here, and I, and I, and I know I, I talked to the city manager earlier and, and some of the staff, and I, I just didn't, I didn't remember to discuss this, but I know we have a selection committee. I'd like to, in the future, if we can, if you can, um, in our package, if we can get or the names of the individuals that are all a part of the selection committee as well as how they rank the, uh, the different committees. Uh -huh. I mean, that's just... Uh, some information that I'd like to see and then um, I know how the ranking is done and how the process goes but I don't know if the other two um, the new council members know but it'd be nice if they had that information <coughs> as well so if they don't sure. have it or if the city manager had yeah, we uh, can include the address that with sheet. them so they know right. how they're ranked and, mm -hmm. and uh, just if we can do that the next time you know right it, it's not a simple process and yeah, I know. you know it's uh, yeah. but it's uh, but if we, if we can do that just for their information so they know how the process works, that would be really nice. But uh, with that being said, is there any representative here from uh, WNJ or no? I don't think so. Okay. WNJ is the same construction company that did our um, fire stations, right? That's correct. They did station one as design build, and we did stations two and three as a direct bid. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me, Mayor. Um, yeah. Just for clarification, you want the scoring sheets and um, the names on all contract awards? Yeah, yeah, just so we can see how they uh, it breaks down who who I mean who was a part of the committee, how they scored them. Just because we've had issues in I know before, and I'm not saying that we're going to have any issues now, but it'd just be nice to see that and, and know. Okay, I just want to make sure because purchasing is under me, so that yes. information will be supplied yes, by my division. Thank you. It's just a, 
a little bit of accountability, that's all, and, and okay, uh, no, just transparency. Make sure I'm getting what so. you're doing. Okay. Um, any, any comments or? So I, I had a question about the, the contingency amount. Is that including like an all, no change orders would be o above that amount for the contingency? Right. Uh, the way it's anticipated right now is the cumulative change orders would be that amount. Mm -hmm. um, right now we are looking at some changes to the building to increase the square footage. Mm -hmm. And chances are we may not be able to get the building with the value engineering savings plus the additional cost for the additional square footage so it's, it's probable that we'll be back right. with a little revised site plan that may be a little bigger to accommodate other other needs in there um, before we're done is that that additional footage that the county would be providing the extra funds for for the what 20 feet yeah. or 15 feet well i know um uh, the, the county has indicated and i think nancy can um better articulate that the county has indicated their willingness to participate with the relocation of the Brevard Community Action Team to what level based on their needs is something I mean, we just had a meeting yesterday and got an understanding of the additional yeah. 2100 square feet and, and then Nancy is going to be working with the county to find out to what level they can participate. Anyone else? Um, Mr. City Attorney, I got a question. Um, should we <coughs> approve this as, uh, uh, depending on what we approve or disapprove, um, should we go um, um, item one, two, and three, or just as one? Just to um, if, if the council's um, okay with the recommendation, you can just approve the item as recommended. Okay. okay. Well, motion to approve. Second. We got a motion by Councilman Gorn, a second by Council, I mean Deputy Mayor uh, Warner. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously, 5-0. Uh, um, we got our, thank you, sir. Appreciate thank you. It. What, what's the date on the completion? Is that, I, I remember, seeing, I think it said December, is that it, It's correct? approximately a year. Um, so yeah, it would be uh, December sometime. Thank you, sir. And then we got our information agenda with the, um, uh, it's all under the finance director. That's just for, that's what it is. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, uh, the committee. Uh, yeah, advisory boards and committees. Anyone need to come forward and and speak? Uh, no? But you don't have to talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now we're going to go to city administrations. Uh, Mr. Wegreth, any reports? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, our contractor, uh, Goodson Paving, uh, has started disrupting people's lives <laughs> in, uh, down on Oak and Derby right now. They, I believe they milled this morning. Uh, we got very little notice because the milling machine, literally about 50 feet long, uh, very high demand, and our job is very small, so when they could get it, they got it. Yeah. Uh, they, they started milling. Uh, they've already begun uh, installing curb ramps and so forth. Uh, they'll be moving their way up from Oak and Derby on up Brevard and into the village. So uh, they'll be doing some, some in Delanois, uh, Factory, Orange, some, some of the other uh, streets downtown. Oh, okay. so, uh, Thank you, sir. It, it's else? coming. Anything else? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Finance Director, Ms. Bowman. Uh, Mayor and Council, I would like to provide you an update on uh, the FEMA claims related to Hurricane Matthew and Hur Hurricane Irma. Um, to date, um, the city incurred approximately $543,000 for Hurricane Matthew. Of that, the city has been obligated and actually received money from FEMA uh, of about 65% of that claim and there's still about $123,000 that staff is working with FEMA trying to get uh, the money out of FEMA for the costs that are incurred. Uh, with Hurricane Irma, uh, the total costs were about $3.6 million. Uh, about $2 million should be reimbursable, and to date we've received approximately 10% of that claim. 
However, we are star starting to make progress a little bit at a time, and we did actually receive notification in the last week that there was another $12,000 obligated towards the $4 million claim. So I just wanted to inform the council that that's where we are with the hurricane claim. I just wanted to quickly thank uh, everybody uh, from our citizens to council to staff uh, that helped us out during the month of December with all of our uh, events, uh, the toy drives, the shop with the cops, everything that we did. I just want to say thank you very much. Um, without the cooperation and participation from the community, from everybody who helped out, it just wouldn't get done. So thank you. Yes, sir. No report. <coughs> no report. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Just want to remind everyone about Friday, 7.30 in the morning, is our annual economic development breakfast. So hopefully you've all RSVP'd and look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. No report tonight, sir. Thank you, sir. No report, sir. Okay. Now, Ms. Shealy. No report. Mr. City Attorney. No report, sir. Mr. City Manager. Well, Nancy made my report a little bit less. <laughs> uh, first, uh, I provided you all a copy uh, this upcoming Tuesday, January 15th, at the Palm Bay City Council Chambers. From 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., the Brevard County Legislative Delegation is holding their meeting. And um, while it's a general request in nature, uh, we kind of outline um, one, Obviously, we would like the legislature to stay in their lane, if you will, and to respect, you know, or oppo respectfully oppose any legislation that opposes uh, or erodes or preempts municipal home rule authority, uh, allowing you as the local elected officials to make decisions in the best interest of, you know, our community. We live local, so therefore, we should, you know, you should all be making the decisions. Uh, there's a number of pieces of legislation out that already has some concerns. Um, to uh, the, the city, again, continuing to express its support for legislation providing for enhanced coordination and resources leading to the restoration of the Indian River Lagoon. It's not just a Brevard problem, it's a regional problem, it's a state problem. And it, I would also say in large measure it's a federal problem and we've provided some numbers there on the, um, the economic impact, $7.64 billion a year based on a Treasure Coast Regional Planning Study that was funded by the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. Um, the city is seeking legislation that would modify the existing community contribution tax credit program, mm -hmm. and it provides a specific statute there to enable local mm -hmm. government participation in housing projects, and that they would basically essentially administer, structure, and, and run the program similar to the voluntary cleanup tax credit, where we are eligible as a, uh, an, an entity and to uh, participate. Uh, as you, as you all are aware, the, 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 the city has supported and continues uh, several serve in, in, a, in a leadership capacity with the Endeavor Community Partnership School. Uh, so we are requesting the legislature to continue supporting the community schools program initiated uh, and administered by the University of Central Florida Center for Community Schools and the Child Welfare Innovation and the Children Home Society of Florida. And then finally, um, the city support, you know, sort of legislation to protect, enhance, and improve municipal, muni muni municipalities' use of community redevelopment agencies to carry out redevelopment and community revitalization. So um, we uh, provided this to our, our lobbyists as well, and uh, we will, uh, I will be there presenting any, you know, and, uh, at the meeting and uh, just warn the vice council on that. And then uh, the other, uh, a couple other items. Um, back in October, uh, the city council adopted a resolution uh, related to the police community, police community relations advisory committee. And um, pursuant to the resolution uh, 2018-097, each council member, you know, shall have one appointment, uh, as well as the Coastal Florida Police. Neverland Association shall have one appointment. And finally, uh, a city council member, the city manager, or the police chief can nominate a member of a civic organization as defined in the resolution. Um, I will provide applications to each member of council. Uh, and just re we're requesting you identify your nominee and have that person submit their application. 
the chiefs were working on an orientation program and uh, because there were quarterly meetings and we want to get them going and having that first organizational session and then so um, if you could uh, we would like to have that first one in April um, working with the councils or the the uh, clerks uh, calendar and the one thing I do want to add in the chief w will be um, We'll probably have to work with the city attorney to come back to look at the one of the requirements that we made regarding dispatch as it relates to some of the access to criminal justice information and FDLE requirements, uh, maybe the exposure and understanding by virtue of the orientation, but there was also a requirement, you know, for so many hours of ride along, so many hours of dispatch, and the dispatch uh, requirement may pose some problems. So. Um, We'll work on that in the meantime, but we would still like to get the board constituted, have the attorney come in and go over the, the proper rules and procedures, understanding of sunshine, how to run the meeting, things like th that we did with, we do with any new board. So, um, so we'll provide, I'll provide you those applications and if we just, you know. Was there a requirement in that ordinance, John, that the person with a point live in our district or just in the city? Live in the city. Uh, you know, I have the resolution right here, and I don't believe it was that person who resided in your district. It's each council member had the opera, uh, um, to appoint a member. Okay. Yeah, the but the members do have to live in the city? In the city of Lakeland, yes. Yes, they do. Yes. <coughs> so, and then. Um, can, can you supply us a date that you want the application to be turned in by so everybody kind of. Okay. I, I, so what I'll do is uh, we'll get with uh, I'll get with the chief and the city clerk because we're trying to find you know with all the meetings that that actual even though this is quarterly, yeah. what's that first meeting date and then we'll kind of back it in there. But I mean, I, I would say if, if you could get them in by February, I mean that would be like a February, you know, like maybe mid February, February fifteenth, or that first meeting in February or yeah, about a month from now. Work. Yeah, and if you need more time, you just the idea, the fact that we the orientation program get to work with the city attorney's office to schedule, and work with the clerk's office to make sure the attorney's office is available and get, and get everybody orient, orientated, uh, is something that we need to do in addition. So, uh, and, I, and I know we're going to do it, but we, I just want to make sure that we we're very clear and that we make sure that everyone knows the purpose of this this. Um, advisory committee because I, I think some have some ideas of what it's about and it, it's not it's nothing like they think it's going to be it's um, and um, the reason it's taken this much time is because we're just getting in the office and there's been a lot going on and we want to make sure that whatever we do we're doing it right and um, that we're um, we've got we've crossed all our T's and dotted all our I's and, um, and we're not rushing to, to do something and, and uh, and um, regret it later on. So, and, and, and I will, uh, or maybe I'll ask the city clerk to send out resolution 2018-097 to each council member because this way, it, as the mayor indicated, it does uh, align the purpose and <coughs> their roles and responsibilities. Um, you know. uh, just a couple other housekeeping items. Uh, one. Uh, some council members have requested to receive the uh, police department daily reports and news releases, and um, and it's it's an individual preference. Uh, we just like to have um, you know to, to let the clerk or the chief know, and we'll make sure you're added to that list. Some are fine with just the text alerts. Some want the daily reports. Some in the news releases. We have the, just let us know what your preference is. It's an individual preference, and we want to make sure the new members are. Aware of that, um, uh, there also has been expressed interest in relocating the existing mayor and city council office from the first floor located in the city clerk's office to the third floor. And by way of background, there was originally an office on the third floor. Uh, it was infrequently used, and many many met past members met with constituents. Um, although there was an office available, they met with the constituents in the clerk's office in that existing office. Uh, with the need for additional space for, for finance, we have the deputy director, the senior budget analyst, and the grants administrator because we hired a staff account and we had a supervisor that didn't have a, a, an appropriate office. 
uh, we did, you know, had to rearrange and kind of reorganize. Uh, HR used to be when City Hall was built, HR was on the first floor. They're, they're on the third floor because of the expansion of customer service. So we've had to move some things around. Um, uh, we can rearrange and make some modifications to accommodate relocating the mayor and council office back to the third floor if that's the con consensus of city council. We're just trying to get that consensus. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to sit back at the original location. I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't think I, I, Anthony I, I, having, uh, the city attorney have an issue with that. And, and I know there's some that don't want it, but I know I've had <laughs> probably, I've probably spent uh, close to, God, I can't tell you the hours that I've spent up here at City Hall in meetings and uh, within the last couple of weeks. And, uh, and uh, for me, it's a privacy, a privacy deal. I mean, I've met with some individuals when there was other individuals that was coming up there and need to talk about some utilities issues. So um, the, the original intent when the city hall was built was for the, the council office to be upstairs in a secure location. And, uh, and that was the purpose of it. And uh, I was a part of that, that whole discussion when it happened, when the city hall was built. And uh, but I know there's some others um, want it downstairs. If you like to meet downstairs, you're more than welcome to meet downstairs in the clerk's office. That's your prerogative. But I, I like having my privacy. I like being up there when I'm talking to some of my constituents and, and some others about city business. Uh, I like to have that privacy and to know that I'm in a secure area. So um, with that being said, I'll uh, open it for a discussion with the rest of the council. We got Councilwoman Kosh. Well, I was just going to say that um, I sent a letter today to all my constituents announcing that I will be having office hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays with the idea that, you know, I'm available by phone, by email, but some people are just more comfortable coming in and talking with you, so appropriate office space is important. And I have, as I know you have, Mayor, been putting in uh, anywhere from 40 to 80 hours a week. <laughs> And um, anyway, it'll be good to have uh, a discipline, an office space, a place where I know my constituents can find me uh, without question. Okay, um, Council, um, Deputy Mayor Warner. Yeah, I, uh, when we moved the office back downstairs, there were a couple reasons for it. One was in the six years that I've been back on the council, I used the um, council office exactly one time and that was to meet with um, an organization who was um, under some uh, privacy constraints and um, needed to have a private meeting um, but um, it's my feeling that um, anytime a council person is having meetings those meetings should be transparent to the public and so when I meet with my constituents I meet with them in the public I don't meet with them in City Hall because my job is not in City Hall my job is out there in the city. My job here is to set policy for the city council. And my job is not on the third floor. We have staff on the third floor. And I was involved in the city several years ago when council members chose to meet in city hall. And the staff, um, whether rightfully so or not, um, felt intimidated by the constant presence of council members in their work area and their workspace. And because of that perceived intimidation, some things happened in this city to cause us to have to spend a lot of money on a forensic examination. We had some issues in our housing department that um, created some horrible situations for some of our citizens. And we had uh, staff members and council members who should have gone to jail over what was going on in City Hall. And we got very lucky that they didn't. Um, we had some issues with our federal funding because of it. And um, it just created a situation where um, staff felt intimidated enough by the presence of individual city council members that they did some things because those council members requested those things be done that were illegal and inappropriate. And I don't ever want a member of this staff to feel like they have to um, do something for me because 
as an individual, I have no power. My power comes when I sit here. My power comes from the votes of two other council members. I am nobody when I'm not sitting in this meeting <coughs> as a council member. Do I work for my constituents? Yes, I do. And if I have a constituent that has an issue, my job is to take that issue to the <coughs> city manager, not to Mr. Wegriff, not to the finance director, not to Nancy, to the city manager. Because our charter says that the only person that I should be talking to about city business is not the department heads, it's the city manager. If the city manager says to me, you need to talk to this department head, then I will be happy to do that. Now, I may pick up the phone and call the department head if I have a question about something that's taking place, <coughs> but it's not my job to direct or to make an employee feel like I am asking them to do something. The city manager works for, for me and you and the city attorney. These people don't work for me. I don't have any rights to tell them what to do or ask them why they're doing something except as that comes from the city manager. And he's been gracious enough to allow the council to talk directly to his department heads, but only to his department heads. And he can take that right away from us any time. And under the, right, uh, under the charter, we have to adhere to that. And I, like I said, I just don't ever want a <coughs> member of our staff to feel like anybody's looking over their shoulder except their boss, the city manager. And if I'm unhappy with something that's going on in City Hall, I'm going to the city manager. And I don't ever want a staff member to be going, oh my God, here she comes again. And believe me, it happens. I've been in City Hall and it happens. And whether it's our intention to intimidate staff members strictly by our being elected officials, staff members are intimidated when we're in City Hall. I choose to meet with people in the clerk's office for two other reasons. One, the city clerk is in charge of the public records. And any time I meet with somebody in City Hall, it should be a public record. Now, if we're going to start meeting on the third floor, there needs to be public records of when the council members are on the third floor and who they're meeting with. Another reason why I meet with my constituents out in the public, because the city clerk's not responsible for keeping a public record if I'm sitting at Dixon Diner with Mr. Greenwood over here. I just think it's a bad idea. It sets a bad precedent. It's caused problems in the past. And I have absolutely no reason to be in City Hall 40 hours a week. That's not my job. Mr. Bolvier, Councilman Bolvier. I got to combat with uh, what Brenda just said. Because in my nine years that I've been on the City Council, in the nine years that I've been on City Council, I've interviewed everyone downstairs. I've interviewed with high school students, young ladies, and not wanting to be alone in the room, I invited Miss uh, Shirley to sit in on the meeting to have present known there. That way there's no accusation made that he did this or said this and that, that. And I think like, like Brenda Warner said, everything's public record. If on the third floor that we have security on the third floor now, you can't get up there unless you have our badge. So how are people gonna get up there? They're not gonna be able to get up there. We've had people walking around upstairs. I'm, I got the floor, if you don't mind. Yeah, let him talk, please. I let you talk, yeah. and I didn't disturb you, did I? Councilman Bolvera, just go ahead. Well, I'm just and making it clear. What you have to I didn't say. disturb anybody. I kept quiet. Sorry about that, Lorraine. But, but you know, we've had people walk around the hallways upstairs. We got finance, we got HR, and manager's office. You know, these the city manager and assistant city manager have work to do. They just can't take people off the street because they went up on the third floor. Hey, can I talk to you a minute, John? That's why we have the security up there. And I think having it downstairs, like Brenda said, it's public, public uh, notice. The public has the right to know what you, who you're meeting with and what you're saying or what the reasons were. That's why when I have a meeting, and especially if it's a, somebody young and a, even a female, I always have somebody in there with me. I will not interview or shut the door when I'm having an interview with, with a person, unless it's a gentleman, and you know we're talking, but I think it's a bad idea to go back to the third floor because I'm the one that requested it, along with uh, Clarence Whipple and uh, Jerry Blanco, that we move the office downstairs because it's a lot more convenient. And I think that's what I'm going to stick with. Thank you. Well, I'm going to make a, a couple <coughs> of comments here. I disagree with probably 80 percent of what I just heard, and um, and the reason being is I was on the council for eight years, 
never had an issue, um, never intimidated the staff. And um, yes, I have a reason to spend about 40 hours here because there's a lot of information that I'm trying to um, receive and get. Um, we got a lot of concerns um, from our citizens with reference to some things that are happening in our city. My, do my job doesn't just stop out there on the streets. It, it, it continues out there and here in City Hall. And if I want to meet with constituents here or business owners or whatever to discuss some issues or problems they have, and they want to meet, we meet with me in private, private, that's the way it should be. And that's the intention. I, I'm not fearful of what someone's going to think or what someone's going to say. They sign in downstairs. That's their records that they're signing in. And they can put down there the reason they're, they're signing in and who they're meeting. We come downstairs and get them. Like I said, if you want to meet downstairs, then you do that. There, there, I don't have an issue with that. But I don't want to hear a whole bunch of crap about, you know, intimidating employees. And, you know, it's about accountability. It, it's about transparency. You know, just listen. It's about transparency. And the thing about it is there, there's not a problem, you know, with council members meeting their constituents or whoever upstairs. I mean, that was the purpose. And there's a security reason. You know, not everybody has access to the third floor or second floor. And you said, who's, how are they going to get up there? Well, we come down and get them. No one's lazy. Get up out the chair. Go down there. You know someone's coming. You got an appointment. You get a phone call up there. You go down and you get them. Just plain and simple. That's, that's the process. That's the way it works. You know, we're making a big deal out of nothing. We're making a, a big deal out of something that, you know, it's a simple request. It, Jerry Blanco's not here. Former Councilman Whipple is not here. And that's just the way it is. You know, if they did things one way, then so be it. That's the way they did it. This council, there's a new makeup here in this council, you know, and that's just the way it is, you know. And yes, yes. Would a, would a bottom so still like to I'm sorry, sir. Would the would the bottom still be still have access to the bar? Yes, would you we, we would. Somebody else down. No, we would not. We would keep the, I mean, some of the materials that were moved out to make the office more suitable might be moved back in with the, leaving the yeah. conference table. We have, we have staffers up there, like Mr. Wegraff has an office over at Public Works and he has an office upstairs, you know, and, and there was uh, multiple, there's uh, 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 Ms. Hamilton is no longer with the city of Coco. Her office was upstairs, it's vacant. The city attorney is there, but he's not there that often. And, and it's kind of ridiculous, you know, we work for the citizens, okay? And then our, our, our staff and the city manager works for us, this council. And it sends a bad message, and I told the city manager that. We had a discussion about it. It sent a bad message. It sends a message of who's in charge, who's running the city, who's doing what. You know, I don't want to send that message. I don't want to send that message. I want them to know that we work for them, and then our city manager work for us, and it just goes on down, and that's the way it works. And we're here to do a job, and we're going to do that job. And if it takes me being here to get the information I need to move, for, move the city forward, then I'm going to do that. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we're requesting, a lot of things that we're trying to do. I mean, it, it, to think that I shouldn't be here in City Hall, I shouldn't be here doing the job that I was elected to do, that's, that's crazy. You know, I'm not just spending 40 hours here. I'm riding throughout the city, every district every district and I'm talking to people I, as I see them in my travels whether it be in the grocery stores whether it be in their neighborhoods I'm I'm talking to them because I want to know I want to know how they feel and and where they like to see the city go where they want us to go where they want us to head what they want us to be as a city and that's what I'm doing and I can't speak for a lot of people I know and like the chief said we've been busy over the holidays I can't speak for everybody on this council but I know I've been busy, and I know there's others that have been busy because I've seen them in my travels. And uh, so if we're going to get to where we need to be, then we need to get out there and we need to get involved. And the staff knows, and, and, and I've talked to the staff. I've introduced myself to most of the staff. I don't get in their way. I don't go to them and say, hey, I want you to do this. I don't want you to do that. I talk to the city manager. But if there's some paperwork that I need, some simple paperwork, then I'll ask the staff, to, could you please print this up for me? I need this right here. 
so I can do my job. And uh, it's simple. I mean, it's just simple. Yeah. And, and to say that the council member is present intimidates the mm -hmm. staff, that's crazy. Uh, uh, to, me that, to me, that's crazy. I mean, it, it shouldn't be that way, and I don't believe it's that way. You know, so um, it, uh, that's enough with this. Um, you know, I, I'm in support of it going back upstairs where it was. And uh, Can, you know. Mr. Mayor, Council, okay, yeah. got consensus. I just want to, the, the former location is problematic with how we rearranged and located. Mm -hmm. So uh, the office, uh, what we were looking at doing is putting it, you know, kind of, we'll work on it and get with you, but it's going to be like where the city manager and the uh, assistant city manager are located. We obviously, well, you know, we have the administrative services director's office up there. There's going to be cognizant of some HIPAA concerns, just meeting with employees and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, there's also some, some finance records, making sure that we're, you know, while, while the records are all available, should you be asked, but we certainly want to make sure there's checks and balances there. Oh, so yeah. we will, um, you yep. know, and I've talked to the city attorney today, but moving, so. Uh, but it was, it was a, and I'm going to interrupt you, it's never been an issue. It haven't been an issue. I don't know about the previous administration, but I know the, the administration prior to that, that I was a part of, it was never an issue. And I, I, don't, I don't want it to be an issue now. There's no reason for it to be an issue now. So, no. so this you know. and I apologize. I wasn't saying that it was problematic to go yeah. to the third floor. It was just that yeah. the, the former office, the, 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 the re, that, that whole wing is really finance and purchasing now, and we'll be adding, putting <coughs> others, you know, finance director and administrative services director yeah. over there, and then bringing and moving the assistant to the city manager, moving her, and, and creating those two offices as you first walk in. Yeah. So I just want to, it just, when you said the, the old office, it, it, so I uh, just want to yeah. clarify it's just, that. It's just, you know what, there's so much stuff happening <laughs> in our city. There's so much stuff that needs to be done in the city. There's so many problems in the city and with the city. There's so many things that's been neglected. There's so many um, um, sections of our cities that's been under service, and I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it as well as the residents are sick of it. And uh, they've been coming to me. They've been calling me. And this is this is not me. This is this is not me just telling you how I feel. I'm telling you what I've heard and what I've gotten from the residents in the city. They're frustrated. They are frustrated. They're frustrated with the blight. They're frustrated with some of the crime, the criminal um, element that's happened in their community. They're frustrated with our parks. They're frustrated with our sidewalks, our streets. I'm sick and tired of it. I'm sick and tired of hearing excuses. We got to get it done. We're going to get it done. And that's why we were elected to office. And that's why you have the individuals that you have here right now. We're going to get it done. And, and it's going to get done. It's not, we're not going to do it by ourselves because, you, you know, the community is going to be involved. We're going to get it done. We're going to change what's happening in our city because there's no reason for our city to be in the condition that it's in and us to have the issues that we have, considering where we're located, considering what we have. You know, 1,900 residents. 44% rentals, and then we got almost 300,000 water customers, and we're dealing with this? No, no it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. I, I've listened to this. I, I've, I've watched this happen over the years. I was on the council before. I wasn't happy with some things that was happening then, but you know, it is what it is. But uh, we're going to change that. We're going ch to change this. We're going to change what's happening in our city, and, and it's just time. It's, it's our time. There's a reason for everything. There's a reason why you have the individuals that, that are here right now. It's time. It's time for change. And uh, I, I've, I know I've, I've harped on this. I, I just, this is our third council meeting, and, uh, and this has been the, the, the third council meeting where we've had controversial issues that are just absolutely ridiculous to me that I mean whether it be misinformation or whatever the case might be but I'm, I'm sick of it and the staff know I, I'm behind them hundred percent I support our staff I support what they do but the thing about it is I just want it done right I want I want um, equality across the board I, I want um, same level of service everywhere I don't care whether you have or you don't have what you drive where you live, it doesn't matter to me. Everybody deserves this, deserve the same level of service, you know, when it comes to what's happening in their community. You know, when I sit on a, a porch 
and then I'm seeing all this activity and prostitution, the prostitutes being dropped off, uh, like a, a drug drive through you know, come on up and, and, and get what you need here. When I see that, you know, it's not happening throughout the city. I mean, there's, there's a portion of the city this is happening in, and you know what? Those individuals have the same right that everyone has have to go out, enjoy their house, enjoy their yards, and just enjoy their parks. You know, we have all these amenities in our city, and you know what? Our kids and no one's enjoying them. We got parks right now that's been overrun. You know why? Because our kids aren't using them. We don't have anything to offer our kids. No programs in our kids. They're having to go to Rockledge or Fort St. John. Why not here? Why, why can't they use our parks here? Why don't, no one wants to come to our city. No one wants to enjoy our parks. No one wants to, you know, it's sad. It is sad. And, and I'm not going to blame our police department. We got, we got some good officers. We got to be excellent fire department. We got some great staffers. We, we got to stop this. We got to show people that we care. And, and uh, I, I'm not in this for a street or, or, or a building named after me. I'm here because I care about my community. Mm -hmm. You know, and the best thing that can happen and the best reward I can get is for people to be happy and just say thank you, you know, about time. And that's what I want. I, I just, but anyway, I, I'm, I'm sorry about this. I apologize for, for going on with this, but it's just enough is enough. We, we, we got to do better than this. We're better than this. Yeah. And then we're sitting here arguing about where the council's office is going to go. Hmm. Are, are, are you kidding me? You know, with all the issues we have in our city? Come on. And then, and then we, we, at another meeting, we were arguing about uh, uh, a group of uh, homeless individuals, you know, uh, being given a meal on, on, on Christmas. And we're arguing about that? You know, come on. I mean, it, it's just ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. I'm just so frustrated and, and just, it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I care about people and I, and I care about um, people feeling safe and enjoying their homes and their investments. And um, it's just unfortunately not everybody feel the same way. And, um, but anyway, with that being said, Mr. City Manager, you, you, you've got my directions. I, I, I just think it, I will be meeting people, individuals on the third floor whenever I meet someone. And if it's something short and quick that I can address down in the, in the clerk's office, I will. And I've done that in the past. But if it's a set down, well, I know we're going to be a while. We're going to meet upstairs in the office and, and have our conversations in private because not everybody <coughs> wants their business out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and uh, but that's just the way it is. And I apologize, staff. I was hoping this was going to be a short meeting. And... Uh, but I'm, I'm just, as you can tell, I'm frustrated and, and uh, I'm just tired of the crap. You know, I, I'm just tired of it. And uh, we're, we're, we're grown. We're, we're leaders, supposedly leaders of the city and leaders of the people. And, and uh, we sound like a bunch of kids, and whiny kids up here, you know. And then I just, it's, it's crazy. crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. No, I, yeah. oh, no, I understand that, Councilman. I understand that, Councilman. Well, Mr. C C Mr. City Manager, you have um, your marching orders, uh, and uh, yes, sir. And we could just move from there, sir. Uh, finally, I just want to address. Um, there was an item that was presented under delegations. Um, you know, I looked at Chapter Eight, Article Three, as it relates to the Diamond Square Community Redevelopment Agency. Uh, there are no term limits um, uh, related to the, the membership of the, uh, of the board. And then the other thing I would just add, each year since they've been in existence, they have been part of the cities uh, and then they've been independently audited, you know, as part with the city's auditor. Uh, so th their books are audited every year. Are there, are there any term limits on any city board? Uh, not that I know of. Everything, everyone has four years, and you can be reappointed. That's correct. That's what the it, will, yeah, that's at the add, will of council. And, yeah, and I can add that, you know, uh, these are volunteers, and and and, uh, and then sometimes we have uh, actually some issues with filling some of these boards, and uh, you know, and I, I just can't. Uh, I mean, I understand what some what the 
Uh, Mr. Waters is saying, but I, I just feel as though I just don't want to see term limits on volunteers that are actually volunteering their time for the city. It is just, you know. Mr. Mr. Waters, I, I, I know you've had your chance to talk. I just want to. I'm just telling you how I feel, sir. And and I just and and I, and, I, and then we want experienced people on these boards. And I mean, sometimes it takes a little while to get some experience, and you want experienced people on your boards. And uh, but anyway, uh, with that being said, Mr. City Manager, were you done? I'm, I'm, uh, thank Councilman, you very much. I'm going. Uh, report, please. All right, where do I begin? Um, the first thing, I'll, I'll start with something good. Um, we did a project uh, re revitalizing Diamond Square um, last week, um, headed by Victoria Michener. Um, several people came out to help. Uh, Councilwoman Cost and the mayor, uh, Brevard Dem, showed up, and several other members uh, from downtown Coco, Merritt Island, all over the place, uh, to revitalize Diamond Square. The object of this is to um, you know, street by street, try to clean up our area. Um, so we started, we chose Blake Avenue uh, based on, we have Immajua Charter Academy, we have uh, the real churches on that street. Um, so we're going to be moving around throughout the city, uh, revitalizing them with the help of um, the community. Um, so we had about $5,000 worth of trees uh, donated um, to us. Um, so we planted, I think, maybe 30 plus trees. Uh, we still have some more to plant in that area so what we trying we're just trying to you know do do our part uh, have a community do their part and uh, try to clean up our area so I, I like to take the time to appreciate uh, Ms. Victoria um, for for heading that up um, uh, Linda Seals from University of Florida Brevard Extension Services they uh, I've got to meet with her Friday at 2 o'clock she's going to assist us with more plants and to help teach the community how to plant and uh, we just want to get some encouragement um, throughout the city then to keep our properties up um, so that that's one of the small things we, we're trying to do just to encourage the people um, you know one, one good thing that that happened that day while we was planning um, you know several people came out on Blake and because we were planning first of all they were surprised that we was there that's the first thing the second thing is many of them they start cleaning up their yards and they start wanting to start painting their houses because we were out there working, it, it gave them, you know, a little, a little bit of encouragement. They showed that other people um, have value in our community. So, um, so that, that's just one small step that we took uh, last week. Um, so we need assistance as well. Uh, the next one will be published on our Facebook page for the City of Coco for our next date. Uh, we're going to try to probably work on maybe Whaley area um, due to January 22nd is the groundbreaking for. Uh, the first women veteran housing in Diamond Square. Um, so we're, we're tr just trying to clean up our area. We have subdivision coming in that area as well. Um, so we're just trying to do our best to try to clean it up. So that will be published, the date will. Um, another thing that we did, uh, community service in Coco Village Coalition uh, with Direction, with Nancy Elliott, uh, Candace Rogers, uh, Rip Dial came out and helped, and Coco Powell kids also uh, with the direction of Ms. Dolores McLaughlin. Uh, we we painted um, the um, the planners in uh, Mert Thorpe Square. Um, so so what what we're doing? What we're trying to do uh, multiple things: bring people from the other side of US One down to Coco Village, and vice versa. So we're trying to bridge that gap. Um, it, it it hasn't been done. Um, so. I'm trying to make sure I get it done uh, with the help of the community. Um, we had uh, se several issues uh, this week, and I talked to Chief, and you brought this up about um, uh, some of the shootings in the area. So we're going to meet this 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 week, uh, maybe probably meeting for the next couple of weeks, probably. Uh, he, he got a couple ideas and strategies that he, he's trying to uh, develop. Um, so I, I just want to let the neighbors know in that area that you know this is my responsibility um so i take it on my shoulders so because it's on my shoulders i have to do the best job i can and work with our chief um to get these strategies implemented uh some some old strategies we make and go back to uh to stop walking park or whatever it was was called um we have to come up with something um, um but doing doing nothing or or doing minimal 
uh, but it's not going to cut it right now. It's it's it's, it's high time, and, and Chief noticed as well. This is this is the the high power hour, January, beginning of the new year. So a lot of things are going on within our community. Um, a lot of have to do with drugs. A lot of have to do with some you know females in the middle of it. Guys arguing about silly stuff, and 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 a lot of times males at this time uh, don't know how to have arguments uh, and and move past things. So a lot of times. Um, you know, people not fighting no more, they're shooting. It, it's unfortunate, but that's just a reality. So we got to do the best job we can. Again, it's on my shoulders. I'm responsible. It's my area. So I, I'm going to make sure that I do the best job that I possibly can. So don't hold them accountable. Hold me accountable. It'll be on me. So if you want to yell at somebody, cuss somebody out, cuss at me first, please. I'll take it on. Um, uh, what else it is? Uh, I, th I think I think that, that was it. Um. I just, I, I, I just want to make sure that, that we understand that, that you know, this this is a new year, so whatever happened in the past happened in the past in the city. We're trying to move our city forward. Um, I know it's, it's going to be a process. Um, it's not something we can change uh, in one day. So our community, we have to be able to come together, um, argue, of course, but at the end of the day, we have to be able to shake it out and try to move forward and, and go in a positive direction. So. Um, I appreciate any help from the community, whatever that may be. I'm willing to listen. I may not agree with everything that you say. You may not agree with everything that I say, but I guarantee you I'm going to listen, and I'm going to be there for you no matter, no matter what, how hard it may be, even when I'm di feeling discomfort about it. Um, so I will be there to try to fight as much as I possibly can. So, um, so in that Peachtree area, we know, that's, we know the area. Everybody know that's the area. Everybody know that's the area, okay? Yeah. Right. Right. That's right. And, and that's something um, I had a meeting last night um, in Virginia Park with this same thing you're talking about. Um, um, the first thing I'll say is that you don't have to wait on the police department to have these community meetings, right? right? The community can do, we can do our own thing within our own and, and, and along with the police because they already have their events already set up at the time. Am I right, Chief? Oh, yeah. uh, most of the dates are kind of already set. We don't have to, as a community, we don't have to wait on them. You can go door to door and talk to your neighbors. You know, and that's one thing that we're missing right now. We, a lot of, sometimes neighbors don't even know who they stay right next door. They don't even talk anymore like they used to. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if we, we got to find a way to break that. I'm willing to help. I'm willing to get dirty. However, I need, whatever I need to do to uh, help. You got my card now. And, yeah. I got you. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Well, so that's, I'm, I'm, I'm done with that. So I just, just want to kind of get that out there. So um, we're we willing to help. I think uh, all the council members, we're we here because we love the city. Mm -hmm. um, we are in different areas. We come from different backgrounds. But at the end of the day, we channel that in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can't. It's positive has to happen. That's just, yeah. just what it is. So thank you. Council member Beauvais. Thank you, sir. And I have no report. Okay. Well, yeah, I do have one thing I want to say. I know it's a heated meeting, and we all we get frustrated, but we're all here to work together for the city and then move the city forward. Yes, sir. And then another note, the uh, domestic and situation, you know, we have councilman, councilwoman, Clark is here for a very recent miscarriage, didn't she? Yeah, a couple times. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, sir. Um, Councilwoman Cox. Let me start with um, oh, wow, you got a <laughs> volume. <laughs> we have a good result from the last meeting and the whole homeless question in that uh, Anthony O'Flattery, um, a local uh, philanthropist uh, who owns the old Durango property, is going to be housing those meals. And they have a kitchen there. And he is also providing office space to Miriam Moore with the Brevard Homeless Coalition. Mm -hmm. uh, we decided not to do the ad hoc group we had talked about, but a more informal group of citizens that are going to help prepare that inventory of services and come back and talk about some things we can do to coordinate better with the county um, so that we're, you know, it's more holistic. Um, because we have a lot of different efforts in regard to the homeless going on all over the city. So that was a good result. Also a report on, um, you know, I was over at the Jerry Sellers Wastewater Treatment Plant for their Christmas dinner. And um, I'm told I'm the only one, the only council member that's ever gone there for Christmas. But having a background in water and wastewater, I understand the importance of those guys. Not that anybody else is less important, but I think the guys at the wastewater treatment yeah. plant, you know, they don't get a lot of recognition. It's not like something you uh, are bragging about. And I think they do a great job. So um, I want them to know that, you know, I'm in their court supporting them. Um, also attended the Space Coast Realtors Association meeting and met uh, Senator Tom Wright for 14. Um, I think he's real new to this area. Um, we, he didn't realize that we were the water purveyor for the region. Um, he is, uh, but we did at least bond on the uh, Minnesotan thing since uh, that's where my origins are as well. And um, he does seem to have an interest in water, uh, the lagoon, as well as the fact that we're providing water services. Um, speaking of water, the last uh, Indian River Lagoon Citizen Oversight Committee, we voted on our projects for 2019-2020. And there were some really interesting ones that were supported, baffle boxes, smoke testing, um, you know, the living shorelines. And I'm so glad to see that Abby, what's Abby's last name? Diaz. Your assistant, right? Yes, Abby Diaz. You, that she is going to be attending those meetings because they are real education every month. And there are opportunities there that we can leverage to bring dollars in, um, help improve our communities, as well as restore the lagoon. Also, um, I attended my first store opening, the CBD store opening. That was kind of interesting. It's, it's there on Route 1. Uh, the mayor was there with me. Um, I was, you know, I did my own kind of survey there, find out, because these products are really expensive. And the CBDs, of course, these are the, they do not have any of <coughs> the, uh, yeah, it's just from the hemp plant. But they are really expensive, and um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so I was just kind of surveying people, like you know, well, a hundred bucks for a package or for a uh, even for a salve, you know, is a hundred dollars. Um, and you know, there are people really with severe pain. I mean, they're really suffering. And and then, um, well, you met her. My neighbor came in. Um, she has an adult son with autism and they're willing to pay because they've discovered it was the only thing that would relax him so uh you know i hope those prices go down um because obviously uh people are trying to move away from more of the prescribed um, medications and you know the problems we have with um with drugs so um 
in terms of our project last week, I did contact the Master Gardeners. They are putting out a call for us. The idea is that we would have a cadre of people that have been trained, our experts, and can do the right plant in the right place and make sure we're not, you know, creating problems down the line. And then, um, you know, as Holiday and having company made a couple of uh, day trips just to look at some of the waterfronts and um, towns that have been suggested to me as models and that have certain features that we might be interested in. So we went down to Fort Pierce. Um, we went to Bradenton. Um, both of those have the kneeling walls. Um, it was interesting, Fort Pierce, they also have that little island out there, that the man-made island to kind of break the energy from the waves. Um, but they, uh, what I noted in Fort Pierce was they had really good signage and the signage really emphasized the fact that they all came together under a common vision. And, you know, I'm hoping that we're solid on that as well because that seems to be a key ingredient. In Bradenton, I love the big trees over the, um, the walkway. That made it really pleasant and inviting. And again, a lot of uh, landscaping. So, um... That's my report. Thank you, Monica. Captain Mayor Warner. Just uh, a couple things. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, first of all, um, Councilman Goins at bridging the gap between your downtown and the west side of Poco. That's a really, really good idea. Um, I, um, I know there's some people who feel like they're not welcome in the downtown area. Um, and like I told a couple of them, um, I've known the merchants in Cocoa Village for a long time, and they really don't care what color you are as long as your money is green. So um, there's not anybody who should not feel welcome in our downtown. And if you can do it, anything to encourage um, everybody to enjoy our downtown, that would be awesome. Um, while you guys were over there planting plants and getting your fingernails dirty, um, I was helping uh, one of our former police officers, uh, Doug Monda, who um, has uh, formed an organization to help other first responders called Survive First. Uh, Officer Monda um, is working to um, prevent suicide among first responders, and he started a foundation. He had his first um, big fundraiser, which was a 5K in Cocoa Village on uh, Saturday evening. It was a huge success, um, expecting um, 150 to 200 runners, and I think we ended up with over 400 by the time we were done. Um, we had several firefighters out there. We had some firefighters from some other cities out there uh, running in their gear. We had some SWAT officers running in gear. and. Um, for those of you who didn't get to see the pictures, the police chief ran. Um, his uh, daughter uh, finished third in her age group, which meant she beat him. Uh, and um, <laughs> and I think Officer De Los Santos, the son, probably beat him too. So um, um, we had uh, a great time. Uh, I know the merchants appreciated it, brought a lot of people to the village for uh, the evening, and uh, Doug got some great support from um, Ryan's and from the Dirty Ore. Uh, and it's nice to know we can always <coughs> depend on those businesses downtown to support efforts like that. And um, I know he's planning to do it again. I think he's already set next year's date for January the 4th. Um, so uh, you guys, <clears throat> Next year on January 4th, don't plan a planting and you can all come and, and run uh, with Officer Monda. Um, I'd also like to say congratulations to our assistant city manager, Matt. I hear he's added to his family. And um, seems like a quick turnaround from the last one to this one, but time flies, so that may be what it is. And um, like Mr. Uh, Bovere, I would just like to say that... Um, you know, the only chance we have legally to speak to each other or talk about issues is when we're up here, and we're not going to always agree. And if we did, not only would it be boring, you all wouldn't be getting what you deserve out of us. We're all going to have differences of opinions, and we're all going to agree. And I sat on the council previously, like um, the mayor has, 
and no matter what we do or say to each other in here, when we walk out the door, um, that's over and done with. And I got a really good reminder of that over the holidays because I got a chance to visit with former uh, Mayor Judy Parrish. And Judy and I used to have some very heated debates and we seldom agreed on anything uh, when we sat on the council. And it got kind of ugly occasionally. But um, when the council meeting was over, it was over. And one thing that we always understood is that we're all here for the same reason. And why I do not agree that the office needs to be in City Hall, um, this is a consensus or on the third floor and that's what it is. And the only thing that I'm gonna hold a grudge about in that conversation is being called whiny because nobody has ever called me whiny in my entire life. And if the mayor does not apologize for calling me whiny, we are gonna have an issue. Other than that, we're good. I am not whiny. I'm sorry, but I am um, not whiny. And that's you, the end of my report. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, not whiny. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. And I apologize for, and I didn't mention your name. I just said No, whiny. but we all know you were calling me whiny. <laughs> but, uh, but I apologize for that. And I also apologize for anything I might have said that was inappropriate. I, I'm just so frustrated and I'm so passionate about this city. And, 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 and I know that we can do better than we've been doing. And, and I just over the years and I, I mean there's been a lot of uh, different individuals in here and and uh, we're better than this we are much better than this and then chief i know it seems like it you know the police department has been picked on a little bit and and let me tell you something I, I've, I've met your officers i've talked to a lot of your officers we've got some great police officers there mm -hmm. I, I've, I've attended a lot of events with a lot of them over the holidays and and uh and um, had great conversations with them and uh, so don't don't take this as though, you know, uh, that we're jumping on you or everybody's jumping on you. I mean, there, there's a portion, you know, we've talked, the chief and I talked, we had a long conversation, I believe it was yesterday or yesterday. And uh, I didn't tell him what I wanted him to do. He knows his, he knows his job. I, he knows his job uh, way better than I know his job. I mean, I don't know his job. I, I'm not a police officer. And, it, and what would it look like for me to try to tell him how he should be doing his job? We just had a discussion. We talked about some stuff that was happening in the city. Just had a discussion. But on another note, when I talked to the city manager, you know, I try to, you know, give him some directions a little bit and say, hey, you know, this is what we'd like to see. And then it's up to him to go to the chief and then, and then start telling the chief how, you know, well, you know, hey, this is what they're saying. This, you know, we got to figure something out here. So. But the, and I know the chief will tell you, I did not once that I said, hey, I need for you to do this, I need for you to do that, or whatever, or try to tell him how this job. I, I, and and there, there was another issue with cold, and, and I mentioned that, you know, I thought that it should have been handled this way, something. But it was just that. It was my opinion, not me telling him how to do his job. So. Mr. Manager, I'm sorry, Mr. Chief, I'll speak to you guys about the new definition. No, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma'am, you were just talking about it's happened before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I was just saying that, and I just didn't want the chief to leave here, you know, feel as though he's doing a lot wrong. You know, I mean, there, I, I, I know what you guys do, and I know the job you guys have out there, and I just know that we can do better as a community. And, and it's going to take more than just our police department. It's going to take more than just our staff. It's going to take everyone in our community and our city coming together and doing their part. We got a lot of businesses here that are not being held accountable for stuff that's happening around their stores. I've met with a few of them and I've told them, I told them that, you know, some of the garbage and crap that they have around their stores is becoming a nuisance. A lot of the loitering they got having around their stores, that's a nuisance. And I said, and, I'm, and I, I gave them a little bit of a warning. And I said, I'm just giving you a warning that it's got to stop. You got to get out, you got to clean up your properties. I don't. Put some dumpsters, put something out there. You've got to clean up. It's your property. We don't want to see this. The city's going to do its part. You've got to do your part. And I've been letting everyone know that's the way it is. And uh, I'm just sick and tired of the city cocoa being considered or being treated like a dumping ground. I've seen people drive down the street and dump all their garbage out in the street. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm thinking, and there were some individuals that actually live in the city of cocoa. Why do you trash your own neighborhood? You're, you know, I, I mean, it's crazy. 
you know, and just because you don't have a whole lot maybe or uh, don't mean that, you know, that you just do stuff like this. Because let me tell you, I was born, I was born in the PDM projects that are no longer in existence. And when I was probably about seven years old when my parents bought their home in Rockledge. And let me tell you something. I remember every summer um, we cleaned windows. We, there were plants. There was People took pride. They raked. And, and you know, these were projects. But today, I mean, it's like people don't care. You, some of your Section 8s, I mean, I'm dealing with a few of those. I mean, I get phone calls. They go by and I look. And, and there's some serious issues in our city with people just not even caring about, you know, I don't own it, so I don't care. And uh, that attitude's got to change. And, and like Councilman Gorn stated, we got to come together because I look down the village and uh, a lot of our businesses down there, seasonal. That's a joke to me. It shouldn't be seasonal down there. We should have people down there year round. And that's why the people on the west side of US 1 need to feel welcome down there. And I've been telling them, go down there, shop. It might not be anything down there for men, but I'm sure the women are going to find <laughs> some stuff down there. Because there's a lot of shops, and I, I've been through a lot of them. And, uh, but go down there. You know, don't just go to Ryan's and eat pizza. Don't just go to Time Out or wherever. Go down there and walk around. It's a beautiful park. It's our park. It belongs to all of us. You know, let's enjoy it. And uh, I'm not going to uh, – but once again, I just want to apologize. I was hoping to get everybody out of here early because I know you guys had a long day. And uh, I'm not going to go through what I've done. And what I've done over the holidays, I've, I'll just tell you, I've been very busy. And, uh, and Chief, I uh, uh, had the pleasure. We had a, a new officer sworn in, uh, uh, a booking officer. I can't remember the gentleman's name. Sean? Yeah. Um, it was a nice ceremony. It was kind of early in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning. But, <laughs> you know, but it, it was nice. It was nice. So uh, I I'm, I'm want to welcome him aboard as well as that we have a new code enforcement officer as well that's joined forces with the city and I'm sure there's been some others but I just want to recognize our employees and I want to let them know that to me they're all important all our import our, our employees are, are, are important to me because um, they, they, they either make or break you as a, as a leader and if we keep our, our employees happy they keep our citizens happy and then we're happy because we're not getting the complaints, and uh, that's the way I am. And, and I just, I, I just, I just want to make a difference in this city. I, I just want to make a difference. I, I've, I've lived here, been here for 58 years, and uh, it, it's just time for us to, to change what's happening in our city. And with that being said, thank you all for coming out tonight, and uh, um, happy New Year. Be safe going home, and. And once again, I apologize if I said anything that was inappropriate. And uh, if I can get a motion from yeah, someone on the council. We, <laughs> we got a motion to adjourn. Okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Don't Thank you.